we've allowed the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. The fact is something you don't can value when you have it all. You must have it for a while, and then you can understand what you missed. Reverse question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political news is robust. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience, and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know? Welcome uh, everybody here at the Bali. Thank you for uh, showing up on this uh, Sunday evening. Um, this evening is being organized uh, in cooperation with uh, the Jewish Historic Museum and the uh, Embassy of Hungary in The Hague, um, in cooperation with the Bali, about the avant-garde in Hungary in the early 1900s, 1920s, in regards to the current situation in Hungary. Because so often it's stated that Hungary is on the way back um, that it should be undemocratic or uh, even you heard that people say it's going to be anti-Semitic again. But is this true? Can we compare the situation, the current situation in Hungary with what happened in the late 20s, early 30s? And if we even went further on into history, what was Hungary like when it was flourishing, especially the city of Budapest around 1900 was a magnet for a lot of artists coming from all Eastern Europe. And we will have an introduction by Joel Cahan of that situation, also in regards of the exhibition, The Jewish Avant-Garde in Hungary, which is still on till the 24th of September. And after his introduction, we will speak with Agnes Heller, Andras Kovacs, and Ferenc Laszko. I will introduce them further for you when we will give them the floor. But we are very proud and happy that you're all three here, that you make it, and that you will share your thoughts on the current situation, also in regards of the historical background I was just talking about. And I think it's also important to understand that we know so little of the period uh, in between, the period of communism and the moment Hungary freed itself, itself from that and started to, um, to become part of, uh, of the European Union. And I think therefore it's good that we have both an historical, sociological, psychological analysis of the current situation. But first, I would like to invite uh, Joel Cahen uh, for his introduction. He is the former director of the Jewish Museum here in Amsterdam, and he's also the curator of the current show. Joel, please. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I'm very pleased that you all came. Uh, one correction, I was not the curator, but as uh, it was my farewell exhibition, I was the organizer. That's what I'm good in, which doesn't mean that I didn't have many discussions with the curators on what should be in and on what should not be in. And I'm going to give you a little introduction on this exhibition, which is not here, but the main, the leading picture is projected on the wall, on the walls and there. And it is um, a picture which is a face which is tortured. It's a face of a tortured man, Yesho Chigani, uh, whose original name was Wimmer. And when I've said his original name, I'm already at one of the core points of this exhibition, which uh, in a popular term you sh can call identity. Jews in Hungary changed their names. The exhibition isn't about changing their names, but still I think it's good to start with an example from another country where people change their names and which is so wonderfully described by Paul Oster in his latest popular book, 4321. Maybe you all read it, some that didn't. It has the fantastic entrance of this man into Ellis Island in the New World 
And another Jew tells him, when he says, what is this immigration officer going to ask me? He's going to ask your name. And then he said, and when he asks it, tell them your name is Rothschild. If you give that name, you have no problem. And then finally he sits nervous, like I'm a little bit nervous now, at the table of the immigration officer. And the immigration officer says, so what's your name? And he says, ich hab vergessen. And then his name is Ichahop Ferguson. <laughs> so one could say nothing special with Hungary, but a lot is special. And the special thing about the exhibition and the story it wants to tell is very well worded, very well voiced by Radu Stern, who was one of the curators, in his article which he called the Budapest Paradox. And the Budapest Paradox is a term I fought with him. I said, don't do that. Okay, Karl Lueger gave that name to Budapest, but it's terrible. You see, I don't like anti-Semitism, which sometimes means I don't like to talk about it. Wisely, Stern won the battle, and the article is named the Budapest Paradox. And the paradox is that if I'm right informed, still today, there are about 200,000 Jews in Hungary. After all, because a lot happened there, and a lot of anti-Semitism is there, it means that after all, there is this enormous loyalty and being part of Hungary. That's one typification of the exhibition, which is explained in the exhibition because it starts in the, at the end of the 19th century uh, with a group of painters, which in total, we choose this group to be 19 painters all, and they have one thing in common. They were born Jews. And then, let's say half of them, after they were born, the name was changed, and half of them, the name was not changed, and most of them converted to Catholicism or to the Reformed Church, all in order to be more Hungarian. They felt from the inside to the outside Hungarian, and they were forced from the outside inside to be Hungarian. This group of painters is followed from early 1900, from the, the colony, the uh, open air painting colony in Nochbanya, to after the first, after the Second World War, after the Holocaust, with the European school in Budapest. And this is a period which starts with an almost seemingly complete integration and a party of Jewish creativity in Budapest, symbolized by a painting which was hanging in the museum, but it's so popular it went already to another exhibition in Warsaw by Robert Bereni. Robert Bereni, whose original name was Bakhoven, and he wasn't baptized. And Bereni uh, symbolizes with this name, the name change and the identity, but not further, a prolific painter. And the painting shows a man with a top hat with very pronounced, almost the Stürmer-like Jewish traces. Why did Bereni paint like that? because he wanted to show that Jews were part of culture from all sides. They were making it, they were buying it, they were creating it, they were promoting it. That was the paradise-like atmosphere for Budapest, which came into being after somewhere in the 19th century, the influx of Jews in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was already there, but Budapest was a magnet for these people to come to this city. From there on, the exhibition follows the historical line to the First World War, which ended terribly. 70,000 Hungarian Jews fought, were killed. 700 in total, 700,000 
Hungarians were killed. And then it ends with what is called and has been discussed in this center, the tragedy of Trianon, the falling apart of Hungary, the taking apart by the good intentions of Wilson and others. The, some of those Jewish artists who had formed already a group to promote art, to make art more a tool for a future society in the group of Niolchak, the eight, became leaders of the short-lived revolution of 1919, were kicked out, the revolution resulted in anti-Semitism, Horthy arrived, and they went away. They went away already before the First World War to Paris, Berlin, Munich, because the magnet had two sides. It pulled people in, and they were pulled out, and they brought back, again, look at the painting, look at the green on this man's face. The red is the designer, but the green is the big issue. It's the Hungarian Fauvist colors that they made in the Fauvism they learned in Paris. Still, they were kicked out, and they came back. And that is the... The, the paradox, the thing that keeps you busy when you look at these fantastic paintings and at this exhibition, which in one line tells the history of Hungary and its Jews along all the important dates, on the other hand, shows it with the creative expressions of these artists. It ends, or it doesn't end, with the European school after the Holocaust. And what you see there is very, very, even the more avant-garde than the other things. You can so clearly see how these artists that survived, Lili Orshak, uh, Margit Anna, and others, were reworking. In Dutch, you say, uh, verwerken, what had happened, and with their identity, and then this European school was short-lived when communism took over in Hungary. That is, in a nutshell, the exhibition, and it poses the question, of course, how come that they are so loyal to a country where so many terrible things happened, the Holocaust story, uh, the Horthy regime, which followed the Nazi laws very early until Hungary itself was occupied and the huge holocaust happened there in a very short time. The exhibition had as its purpose to research one question which we had researched before, especially with Romania. How come so many Jews were involved in this avant-garde movement? And we didn't have the answers, but one sits in the group of Niolchak and in the European school, that even after all these people want to work with their art for a better world. That's in a 10 minutes, minutes nutshell, the exhibition where the question is, how come the magnet worked? And what can we learn of this today for the future of Europe and Hungary? Thank you. Joel, thank you so much for your introduction. Um, you also sketched the fact that they went out, they, they went to Paris as well. So this interaction between Paris and Hungary, uh, was this seen uh, at that same moment in time also in, in other countries, or was it typical for the Hungarian avant-garde to really focus on Paris as well? Now, Paris was the center, and there were many others who went to Paris much earlier, also from Holland. But in these great groups, and Paris had the art schools which they wanted to follow, but the example of Hungary is exceptional. It's really exceptional that they created by that in one way, eh, you could call this a spachat with one leg, looking how the real artist in Paris worked, and on the other hand, bringing it back and making something better of it. I mean, of course, you, you know, a museum director is a marketing man, person. Uh, we wanted to show that this is fantastic art. And this is on the level of Paris. And it shows it. 
And to your question, uh, I think it was very, very unique. Also, the Romanians went out, but they went to, to found Dada in Zurich. But it's these Hungarians who, uh, who went to Paris, although there were others, of course. You were mentioning uh, the spagat of Paris versus Hungary uh, and bringing it back. I also can imagine there's this other sort of spagat you already sort of uh, remember because of the name change, that on the one hand they were very internationally orientated, but on the other hand they really want to be Hungarian and they wanted to work this into the national identity. Yeah, they, they, the, the, the drive for the change name was not something that was completely forced upon them, like uh, we, the Dutch Jews, in the, in the beginning of the 19th century, all of a sudden we had to take a name, as if we didn't have a name. Of course we have a name. It's my name in the synagogue, isn't it clear? No, you have to have a real name. So they followed that, but it didn't, it enforced their Hungarian identity. And then maybe good to, to, to understand, you mentioning the fact that it was already before 1914-15, in a way before World War I, that this was sort of scattered um, around already a little bit. It, it, was, it was not the Second World War who really ends the no. avant-garde. It was already earlier. No, uh, the, the avant-garde starts early with this change in this uh, plein air colony, the, the St. Martin's Latem, the Bergen of Hungary, not Spania, today in Romania, where they also uh, imported, after being in Paris, fauvist things in their open air paintings. And they are different than open air paintings from elsewhere. And their nudes are different. Yeah? So it's a, it's a thing that uh, happened long before the First World War. Right. So if you. The movement going to, uh, to Munich or to Paris to get knowledge from outside was normal. The, cata the catalyzation factor of the First World War and the, the, the revolution, the, the failed revolution, was the anti-Semitic and the anti-move out, get out, and still they went, came back. Well, that's my last question. If, if that happened on that very moment, you would expect indeed everybody to get out, but that was not the case. No. Uh, the majority state. Uh, have you an explanation why they did it? I don't. No, I have no other than that they liked to be the, in Hungary after all. They regarded this as their homeland. And, uh, of course, groups of people emigrated from there. Mm -hmm. But they, especially these 19 painters, all came back. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you will be uh, following uh, our talk uh, on the first row. And if you have a question of comments, let us know. Joel Cohen, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to introduce you uh, to uh, our three speakers of uh, tonight. First is Agnes Heller. She is, uh, I think, one of the important philosophers of the 20th century, and she studied philosophy under Georgi Lukacs on uh, the Budapest School. And she holds from 1986 on the position of the Hannah Arendt Professorship of Philosophy in the Graduate Studies Program at the New uh, school for Social Research in New York, and she recently moved back to Hungary. I'm not so sure how recent that is, but we will ask you uh, in a minute. Um, and you are now a professor emeritus at the Budapest esteemed university Esfos Etofos Laurent, and you wrote many books. Um, and uh, we're very happy you're here. Can I ask you to join us uh, on the chair? I say recent. When did you went back to Hungary? When did you came back to Hungary? I went back to Hungary after the Kada arrangement was over because I left Hungary because of lack of freedom. Yeah. And when I believe that we have freedom again, at this kind of creed or belief or illusion, I returned to Hungary because it is my country. It is my yeah. Okay. It's my home after all. Thank you. 
Uh, Andras Kovacs, ladies and gentlemen, is a professor at the nationalism study uh, is a professor at nationalism studies and Jewish studies at the Central European University, um, and his research interests uh, include minor minority identities, prejudice, anti-Semitism, and sociological of post-Holocaust Jewry. Um, and in the last years, uh, you have carried out a big research on anti-Semitism in post-communist Hungary. Give him a big hand, Andras Kovacs. <laughs> And we are also happy uh, to introduce Ferenc Latsko. He is assistant professor in history at Maastricht University. And you research political and intellectual history on the monetary and contemporary Europe. And your focus is uh, on Central and Eastern Europe uh, in the 20th century, especially Jewish history and the history of the Holocaust. And you published uh, Hungarian Jews in the Age of Genocide in 2016. Ferenc Latsko. here um, in regards to the exhibition um, you have seen the exhibition already have you have you visited yeah what was you have visited as well the, the exhibition in the you, you have seen the exhibition I haven't seen it I okay. heard about it what was your impression when you saw I know it? about this exhibition yeah. all about I know what this exhibited uh, well I was I liked very much the exhibition and I was very much surprised uh, uh, that the choice of the works exhibited here uh, uh, are so representative for those trends of uh, uh, art which were cutting-edge avant-garde art um, uh, in its own time, and uh, I have to congratulate for this. <laughs> Were there works uh, represented that you already knew, or was, were, were there also works uh, new for you that you didn't see in the in the museum in, in, in Hungary over the last years? I have seen the majority of them because uh, there was a huge exhibition of the group uh, Nyolcak the Eight uh, in Budapest some couple of years ago, and uh, in certain other collections those works which are exhibited here have already shown, but I have seen pieces which I haven't seen before because they come from private collections and they are not public. Okay. Well, we have all asked you to prepare a small statement for about five minutes in reflection upon the exhibition, but also in regards of the current situation in Hungary. Uh, maybe it's good to start with you, and then we go to Agnes, and then we go to Ferenc. Is that okay? So please. <laughs> Well, so subjects are too, quite broad, well, the subjects you mentioned here. And uh, uh, when I was thinking over what should I speak about here, uh, it occurred to me that the sociologists, where I'm a sociologist, uh, sociologists are known uh, that they bore their audience uh, with numbers. And I said, well, I will try to avoid this. But, uh, I'm not responsible for bringing up numbers because Joel mentioned here um, in his talk uh, the number of Jews uh, living in Hungary. And then here, uh, sitting here, I thought perhaps it wouldn't be bad to tell something about the Jewish population of present day Hungary in order to uh, position all that statements we will make uh, uh, later. So, uh, and the numbers are, in a way, interesting because uh, uh, both the, the numbers and uh, uh, the history of Hungarian Jews are, are somehow unique. As you have mentioned, uh, 100,000 or more than 100,000 Jews living in a country in the middle of Europe after the Holocaust and uh, after the Revolution in 56 and after the collapse of the communists it needs a certain explanation. So why, you, you have raised this question before, both of you, why didn't they leave actually? And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the explanation for the number, the explanation for the number which is uncertain, uh, there are minimum and maximum ex uh, 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 estimations, so if you count it depends how you define to be Jewish, if you count the uh, Halakhic Jews, the Jews uh, who uh, are Jewish uh, uh, according to Jewish law, then the minimum number must be between so 60, 
thousand and ninety thousand. If you count those who do have at least one Jewish parent, then the number would be between 80,000 and 130,000. And if you add to this group even those who do have one Jewish grandparent, so who are uh, 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 considered to be Jewish on the base of the uh, law of uh, return, the Israeli law of return, then the numbers go up uh, between 160,000 and 200,000. And then the question is, why is this uncertainty about the numbers? It is because we don't know how many Jews survived the Holocaust in Hungary. Uh, uh, there are minimum and maximum ex, uh, 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 estimations for that, and all the other demographic extrapolations are uh, 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 departing from the, that number of uh, uh, the survivors. And according to certain sources, uh, about uh, 100, 80, 90 million, 100, uh, 100, uh, uh, 190,000 Jews survived the Holocaust in Hungary, according to other estimations, much more. And this is an interesting issue. Uh, so in the middle of Nazi Europe, um, in March 44, this is the uh, 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 time of the German invasion of Hungary and the deportation of Hungarian Jews started after the German um, invasion. There were still uh, uh, six, 700,000 Jews living in Hungary. Uh, the large amount the, the, of them, so the majority of them, could not survive the Holocaust. But actually, the Jews of Budapest survived the Holocaust because the deportations were stopped by the Horthy government uh, before the Jews of Budapest could have been deported. And this makes this 200,000 uh, 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 size uh, group the group of survivors. And this is a fact led to a very substantial change in the structure of Hungarian Jewry. Namely, uh, all Jews of the countryside, from villages or from smaller cities, were deported to Auschwitz and they were killed. But the majority of the Budapest Jews survived. And Budapest Jews belonged to the more upper class, uh, more Hungarianized, so more assimilated, uh, and uh, uh, in a way uh, more uh, uh, educated uh, uh, branch of Hungarian Jewry. So the, that Jewish society, what uh, uh, we face now, is somehow uh, stemming already from a more, more assimilated, more upper class, more educated uh, subgroup of former Hungarian Jewry. And this creates, this makes, this the typical, this makes the face of uh, present-day Hungarian uh, Jewry, uh, uh, whatever the numbers are, but uh, 70 or percent of them uh, graduated at universities, uh, it's nearly most of them living in uh, uh, Budapest, and uh, uh, um, most of them are, or at least the majority of them, uh, coming from families which consider themselves be, uh, of being Hungarian. F families who looked at themselves as successfully assimilated urban uh, upper middle class Jewish families. And this upper, assimilated urban upper middle class, middle class was the audience of these painters, you can, uh, uh, you have heard about them. And this is an explanation for that, why these painters could come back to Hungary. They could come back because, well, as you said, art has something to do with market. There was a market for this. This Budapest upper class educated uh, 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 Jewish bourgeoisie uh, uh, offered uh, chances for moderate or even not so moderate survivor for, for these Jewish artists who returned back uh, uh, from, uh, first from Paris, then after 33 from Germany, because many of them went to Berlin and, live, and uh, they stayed in Germany, but after the Nazi seizure of power, 
they had to move, and they, many of them came back to Budapest. For example, the whole, uh, a, quite a large group of Hungarian artists who were involved in Bauhaus. Okay. Well, so this is the explanation, yeah. one, one factor of the explanation well, for that. Thank you mu so much. I mean, it's about numbers, but it was very interesting to understand what sort of group we are talking about and why in this big numbers have survived the Holocaust. Agnes Heller, can I also right, ask you I to... start the story from the beginning, because the development about whom you spoke and you spoke started at the time of emancipation, emancipation of the Jews in the 19th century, because after the emancipation, there was a tendency towards integration into Hungarian culture. And this tendency was encouraged by the Hungarian, I mean, the upper class, by the nobility. There was a lo liberal nobility in Hungary, liberal ministers and liberal writers. For example, I can mention the writer Jokai Mor, Mor Jokai, a novelist, who once said that in the 20th century, no one will anyway, anymore, know what anti-Semitism is all about, he said, in the 19th century. No, that was a prediction which did not come true. However, there was a problem with Hungarian Jewry which was specific. How can you, how can you integrate when keeping all the um, requirement, laws of the Judaism tradition? And then they invented a new kind of Judaism, yeah, the neolog Judaism, which is only in Hungary. Only Hungary invented the kind of neolog service, which was a service which in a way imitated the one or the other aspect, the Christian service. At the same time, it was a, a kind of compromise between remaining Jews and integrating into Hungarian society. And integrating particularly Hungarian culture. That was important but good because Hungarian Jews started to speak Hungarian, write in Hungarian, contrary to Czech Jews who wrote in German and, and read in German. So that was a really the language and the poetry. The poetry was a very important factor in this. Now, in the beginning of the 20th century, was a, a great tendency of modernization swept over Hungary. And this tendency was everywhere. In the poetry, it was represented by Andrew Ode, in music by Bartok. That was a, a swept over the modernism in Hungary. And Jews were the great supporters of this modernism. They supported Ode, they supported Bartok. For them, they were the new Hungary. When Jews said at that time, that I became a Jew because I wanted to belong to Andrew Ode. That I became Hungarian because I wanted to belong to Andrew Ode, said the Jew. So that was so important. Though the eight, you mentioned the eight, Njolzak, the eight. By the way, all this avant-garde, post-impressionist artists, one, with one, ex, I think one exception, were all Jewish. Uh, they were not all from Budapest, mostly were the, the countryside, from smaller cities, but they were supported by, by Budapest. They were supported by the, uh, by the Hungarian Jewish magnates, that is, the barons. Yeah? Baron Hotwani has supported them. A lot of, lot of money. They supported this kind of tendency of modernism. It was very, very important. So this was a kind of combination the uh, Jewish Nyolsak, that is seven of them, yeah, and Bartok and Ade, that was the, the modernism of Hungarian culture, that made an alliance here. They belonged together, and they even confessed that they belonged together. That was a new thing. That was the end of it. I do not know whether political emancipation can ever lead to social emancipation, but it could not lead because of the world war. And the world war was the original sin of Europe, and because the original sin of Europe, everything got from bad to worse. The whole 20th century got bad from bad to worse because the original sin of Europe. No one knew at that time and that we commit the original sin, all of us, so the Agnes, European people. Your, because the world view was, world war was a European You're, you're sketching uh, the, the, the development of the emancipation of the Jewish uh, society. On the other hand, you say there was a compromise from both sides, both Hungarian 
both you Jewish, to step into this modernism, into this new age, to be part of the emancipation, as you point out? I don't think so. I think that was a Jewish compromise with, with, the, with the fact that we are Hungarians. We are Hungarians, but we are Hungarians. We cannot really, uh, really obey all the, all the laws and the regulation of the Jewish religion. We have to work on Saturdays, for example. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe even that. And you, you say you cannot, that... Huh? Yeah, you say we that. We have to dress ourselves like all people. All people do. We have to converse, and you can, you, and we can paint. Right. It's not forbidden. And are you saying that that it was World War Two, but 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 that was ending the emancipation, or was it already uh, the regime of Hutter when when it came to power, it was ending that emancipation? I don't understand. Well, you say that with, when World War II started, it was the end of the emancipation, or was it already earlier that it, that it stopped, that, that the emancipation of the Jewish community? And, uh, no, political emancipation stopped only in the Horthy regime. Right. Political emancipation was never stopping in Austrian Hungarian monarchy. Mm. I meant that was no social emancipation, because there was political and emancipation, but there was a party, which is called it's an anti Semitic party, and there was blood libel in Hungary, so there was no social emancipation. Political emancipation not necessarily brings about social emancipation. That's the same with the women. There's a political emancipation of women. There is no complete social emancipation of women. We all know that. Yep. So that's happened with the... But in the case of the Horthy period, it was taken back. That is, the political emancipation was taken back. That the equality before the law was taken back. That, that was basically a very huge step backwards okay. in the relationship between Hungary and Jews. And despite of all this, Hungarian Jews remained Hungarian. They were very loyal to Hungary. Uh, Hungary was not loyal to them, but they were loyal to Hungary up to the end. And what you said about Budapest, I think here I have a, a problem, because only half of the Budapest population survived, not the Budapest population. The, uh, I give an example. My father, a Budapest a person a living in Budapest, was, died in Auschwitz. Uh, I had four Jewish boys, we were good friends, among them all Budapest people, three were murdered. Many people were murdered in false papers from Aerocross people in Budapest. You know, that was a, a, that was a, a kind of hunt. Yeah, uh, so even that Jews. is more complicated than you. Yeah. Yeah. So that they not only have, you were right in his sociological and the interpretation, but that's not the Budapest jury, that's okay. a half. Okay, them. Agnes, thank you so much. Um, we go to our third uh, speaker for his introduction. I hope you also will shine your light a little bit uh, on the period after World War II. And I think you feel more comfortable uh, at the cathedral. So please uh, step up. Thank you so much. Ferenc Lasko. Uh, good evening and a warm welcome from uh, me too. Uh, I'm a historian, but ironically enough, I'll be uh, talking about the post-communist uh, period and the question of anti-Semitism in today's uh, Hungary. Just as the hegemony of the political right was being established between 2006 and 2011, the level of anti-Semitism substantially increased in Hungarian society. Despite the xenophobic slide of the country in more recent years, anti-Semitism has not emerged as a major political or social force. It has not acquired the kind of importance which could be feared knowing the modern history of the country and the political traditions of its right wing. However, since the establishment of rightist hegemony, sensibilities in Hungary have changed profoundly. And these changes have resulted in a rather uncomfortable and volatile situation for the Jews of Hungary. Right after 1989, Hungary continued to lack a proper culture of discussion around highly sensitive Hungarian Jewish matters. The increased public visibility of Jewishness, as well as of Holocaust remembrance, but also of anti-Semitism, created a rather misfortunate discursive situation. The charge of anti-Semitism would at times be made quickly and rather vehemently. Sensing the severity of the accusation after the Holocaust, the charge would often be taken as a major offense and bitterly rejected, even if it was in essence justifiable. As a result, mutual suspicions around the subject were quick to deepen. In the early years of the 21st century, there were two milestones in the history of Hungarian anti-Semitism. 
the institutionalization of Holocaust commemoration and, curious as the juxtaposition may sound, the spread of the World Wide Web. The spread of the World Wide Web. The former at first had a clear self-critical edge as it finally aimed to properly highlight Hungarian responsibility. This would soon produce a backlash though. The case of Hungary in fact offers a cautionary tale of what can happen when earnest attempts are made to face local responsibility for the Holocaust at the time of a right-wing turn. The revolution in information technology in turn allowed anti-Semites largely excluded from the public realm till then and typically hiding their prejudices to openly express them even while remaining anonymous. They suddenly sensed how numerous they were and felt much emboldened as a result. The spread of online communication thus played a key role in reducing latency and making anti-Semitism more widely accepted and even normalized. Whereas till 2006, the post-Holocaust phenomenon of anti-Semitism without open anti-Semites could be observed, around a decade ago, the country saw an open revolt against the anti-anti-Semitic consensus on the rising far right and a return to crude forms of hate. By 2014, the time of the 70th anniversary commemorations of the Holocaust in Hungary, there was a dualistic official agenda. An attempt was made to commemorate victims from Hungary without foregrounding Hungarian historical responsibility. With a marked emphasis on the German occupation of the country in 1944 and the attempt to incorporate Jewish victims into the wider Hungarian community of victims, the country's official politics of history has by and large returned to anti-fascist interpretations of the Second World War, well familiar from before 1989. However, this happened with a crucial twist. Whereas previously the fateful day of the German occupation, Mar March 19, 1944, referred to the beginning of a period of most severe violence against Jewish and non-Jewish Hungarians, the current rightist interpretation of this date insists on it having brought an end to Hungarian sovereignty and thus also to the state's responsibility. If this was symbolic ambiguity where clear words should have been the only option, just a year after, in 2015, Hungarian Jews were to face an even more consequential form of official ambivalence. In the middle of the migrant crisis, Hungarian Jews had to confront new political and also moral challenges. They had to experience their government's formal endorsement of what was in essence the position of the far right and the further ethnic radicalization of their society. There was now a recurrent emphasis on ethnic homogeneity and the need to fight the threat of an oriental invasion. At the same time, the government started to play on Hungarian Jewish fears of Islamic terrorism and Muslims in general, while sending them reassuring messages that they shall be protected. Did this point to a certain westernization of Hungarian ethnic radicalism in the direction of an anti-Muslim platform epitomized by the Freedom Party here in the Netherlands? Or was it rather the beginning of the creation of a broad and inclusive anti-Semitic platform opposing white and Christian Hungarians to Jews as well as Arabs? It would be too early to provide a definite answer, but what appears to me most remarkable at the moment is that in its ongoing campaign against key liberal values and institutions today, the dominant party is attempting a curious hybridization of anti-Jewish, anti-Muslim and pro-Israeli stances. While the anti-Semitic character of the state-led campaign targeting George Soros has been debated, it is difficult to avoid the impression that the smear campaign recycles the plot of a wide conspiracy led by a Jewish billionaire. To make things much more complicated, the campaign has been happening at a time when Hungary and the state of Israel under Netanyahu are emerging as important partners. His own and Netanyahu's anti-liberalism might just help Orban create a new hybrid of a pro-Israeli Hungarian regime that plays on popular sentiments against Muslims as well as Jewish cosmopolitanism. This would be a superior, if hopefully fragile, synthesis of local traditions of exclusion and references adopted from the far right further west. Thank you for your attention. Clarence, thank you so much. Uh for making things uh, 
more clear and more complicated. That's very good for, uh, I think, the talk we will have. Agnes, can you explain the fact that Orban, on one hand, is saying um, we are here for the Jewish population, he is working together uh, and he is uh, uh, making connections with Israel on one hand, and on the other hand, you see this fearful campaign uh, towards your source. How can you, how can you explain this? What is his position? It's very difficult to explain, but I think you have to understand the man. The man is interested in nothing else but power. And you see, you know from Kant, you cannot have enough power. You can have always more and more power. And if you are interested in sex, of course, you can be exhausted. If you, you cannot go forever and ever and go more and more, do more and more. The same with eating food. You have to love to eat sweets, but you cannot eat sweets more and more and more, and then they get sick. But you had more and more power. I think it's possible. Power and property and fame. They, they are illimited. There is no limit. And I think Orban belongs to those persons to whom power has no limit. And it is totally, totally indifferent what kind of means he uses for it. I don't think he's anti-Semite, absolutely not. But I think if it is necessary for him to increase his power, he can use the means of anti-Semitism, as he uses not the means of hatred against foreigners, hatred against Muslims. He can also hit hatred against Jews. Why not? It depends on, on whether this kind of uh, conception conception or maybe manipulation of the population, because it's a manipulation of the population, it keeps him in power, increases his power, doesn't increase his power. This is the spirit of illiberal democracy, which is not interested in civil rights. That's why it's Ill illiberal. That's the idea. By the way, if you want to understand him, you have to listen to him, because he says always what he's doing. No one has to sit outside him. He always tells you what he's doing. Now, about the Jewish question, it is not a special question in Hungary. I think Orban is a Hungarian question, not a Jewish question. So I don't think it's a special Jewish aspect in the Orbanian regime and action. This is the problem of Hungary and of the Hungarian Jews because they are Hungarians and not precisely because they are Jews. This is my answer to your question, if it is an answer to the question at all. Well, thank you. Andras, another point I think Ferenc uh, brought up is the fact that, in a way, as long as you present yourself as being not too Jewish, but very much Hungarian, there's not, nothing to be fear, feared about. But the moment you are more open about it, the moment you are very internationally orientated, as you also pointed out, then there is this problem. Am, am I right if I sketch it like this? Well, uh, I think this is a not very typical, this is not the situation in Hungary. So, as Ferenc described it here, it's a very, quite a complicated issue. Uh, being Jewish in Hungary or appearing as a Jew publicly, uh, e even as a religious Jew uh, uh, in uh, a religious costume, whatever, is no risk. So uh, this is why quite a few of Orthodox Jews are stating in Hungary that it is uh, uh, easier to be a Jew nowadays in Budapest than in Paris. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are serious conflicts uh, uh, which are very uh, uh, conflicts in which uh, the majority of the Jews feels uh, a sense of uh, governmental or governmental too much public anti-Semitism. And this is uh, the question of the memorialization of the Holocaust. Uh, uh, in the surveys I carried out among Hungarian Jews, uh, it very permanently, uh, uh, it turned out uh, absolutely permanently that uh, the most important identity factor of uh, present-day Hungarian Jews is not religion and not belonging to the Jewish community, and not to marry a Jewish spouse, whatever, but keeping alive uh, the memory of the Holocaust. 
So the memory of the Holocaust is not simply a, a historical question, it is not simply a general question for uh, the whole public, but it is a very important identity question for the Jews in Hungary or in uh, Budapest. And in this field there is a conflict uh, between official public memorialization of the Second World War and the Jewish memories of the Second World War. Uh, the best example for that is a statue which was raised in the middle of Budapest uh, three years ago, I guess, 2014. Um, uh, this is a, a, a memorial uh, for the victims of the German occupation. I translate it. Yeah, the, the German occupation uh, memorial. And the statue is a huge uh, figure of Ga Archangel Gabriel, who embodies Hungarianness, and the huge German eagle is uh, 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 is uh, 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 arriving from above, from the uh, 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 from. Uh, Above and uh, uh, tears, uh, this uh, pure Archangel uh, Gabriel, the embodiment of the Hungarians, apart. And the message of the statue is that uh, we all, Jews and Hungarians, because in Hebrew there is an inscript in Hebrew on the uh, statue, we all, Jews and Hungarians, were the victims of the Germans. And this is not uh, what the Jewish memory of the Holocaust is in Hungary, uh, uh, in uh, a volume published two, two, two years ago, which collected uh, uh, family histories of uh, second or third generation Jews. Uh, 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 there are very important uh, uh, and, uh, descriptions of how Jewish ident identity looks like in Hungary, and this is based on the memory of the Holocaust. So in this question, there is a conflict uh, between the Jews and the official memorialization. Yeah. Well, the question is what is behind the official uh, presentation of the Second World War? Is it anti-Semitism or it is... Uh, 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 Close sort the of ranks. Hungarian nationalism, yeah. uh, we, uh, the sort of which existed, I don't know, in, before the 90s in Austria or before Chirac in France, etc. Uh, for the Jews, this is a sign of anti-Semitism. Mm. For uh, uh, the official uh, uh, memory politicians, uh, it is not, and they are surprised uh, that what, why we, we do everything. We have yeah. such a, so good relationship with Israel. Uh, we uh, uh, give huge amounts for reconstructing the synagogues in uh, Hungary and for all other Jewish religious issues. Why should we be anti-Semites? Right. So but Ferenc, this is a, can you explain we, a little bit more why this sort of not understanding uh, is about? And is it indeed not based on anti-Semitism, but maybe on just the feeling we have to close the ranks now. Don't open up debate from long ago, but move forward. Where is, where is this feeling coming from? Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, I think there is an official attempt which has roots, I would say. Yeah. Is it talking fine? Yeah. Sorry. Right. Thank you. Which I think has, has um, I would say, transnational roots, and it has been developing for more than a decade uh, in Europe, which is the idea of uh, dual occupations, right? This is a theory which uh, in Eastern Europe is, is widely popular, and it's also widely accepted on the European level, which I find, I think, uh, really important to emphasize. Uh, the fact that countries have been occupied by Nazi Germany and by the Soviet Union. Now, the problem with this theory is that it works for quite a number of places. Uh, Poland would be uh, the most important one, and. Uh, and Poland, of course, is the most significant country that is uh, among, the new, uh, among the new member states of the EU. But it doesn't work for countries south uh, uh, from there uh, who have been allied uh, to Nazi Germany. And that, of course, includes Hungary, but includes also Romania, Slovakia, and Croatia, and, uh, and, that's, and Bulgaria to some extent, even though they didn't uh, fight in the war in the same way. So there are countries uh, in, in, in which when you, when you impose or when you, when you introduce this theory of, of a dual occupation, you're actually shifting uh, responsibility or shifting the blame in a very clear way. And internationally, I, I, I say, it's, it's often not uh, seen as something very uh, grave. 
precisely because there is a regional narrative, there is a kind of Eastern European ambition to talk about totalitarianisms and foreign occupations, right? That's so you have two you know, great dictatorships coming from Germany and the Soviet Union, and they are imposing this will uh, in the countries in between, right? And Hungary, of course, belongs to this region, but its history is quite specific uh, because it's, it's really fighting uh, alongside Nazi Germany until the very end uh, of the war. So, so that, is, that is, I think, the real problem. And Fidesz, I think, is playing uh, in that respect uh, relatively, uh, well, he, they have an easy playing field, right? Because internationally, what they're doing is just in line with Poland's uh, approach and just in line with the Baltic approach uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, so that's, and, and that is very, very fortunate uh, for them, I would say, uh, because that allows them, uh, once again, to, to go back to a nationalistic and vision. It's, right? And it's an easy narrative, in yes. a way. Yes. And in addition, it is memory politics. It is not, a memory politics is not an innocent uh, game because it has a very great impact on present politics. If your memory politics suggests that you were always in the right and everyone else was always in the wrong, and you are the eternal victim, and all the others are perpetrators, I think you do not get a realistic image, self-image, an image about yourself. So I think this uh, memory politics is a policy. It has to do with contemporary politics. I don't know about other nations. As I think the French, they were not occupied by the Soviet Union, had also one-sided memory politics. That leads the French, they rescued 70% of French citizen Jews, at least. Now, they have some right to it, but Hungary has very little right to it, given the fact that the Hungarians uh, sent to Auschwitz three times um, so many Jews as Eichmann asked them to do. So that's the different situation. It's better to look in our face. Why is that better? I think there is something common. I don't want to blame people, but there is a kind of inclination because people have suffered so much and they are poor and they are, uh, they are oppressed in a way. The poor people, they have always been much inclined to know who is the cause of their poverty, who is the cause of their being downtrodden, who is the cause that they cannot have their daily bread, and they have to point at something. And this is the terrible thing that memory politics is the introduction to contemporary politics, to point at a person, to point at that, be sure she not by anyone else, here is the man, here is the devil, he is the cause of everything. And then inside hatred, because hatred, hatred kills the soul of a people. I don't like this hatred because it kills the Hungarian soul. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a joke. Ferenc, I mean, Agnes already pointed out the way Orban is thinking. What has Orban to win if he opens up a debate, if he tries to make history more broadened up and more nuanced like, like Agnes is proposing? Well, I don't think politicians gain much by having historical expertise. I think society uh, gains a lot, you see. Uh, I don't think politicians as such have a vision that, uh, that a, a country which has a very sophisticated uh, public debate about history will uh, function better as a democracy, but that's what we see, right? So that's what I think, again, I'm, I'm, I've, over, I've often been accused of idealizing Germany, uh, and I'm trying not to idealize it at all, but I think there you have very belatedly, one should mention, with several generations delay and with all sorts of major problems in the post-war period, but still you have a process of coming to terms with the past in a certain way, right? Coming to a self-critical uh, understanding of national history, which is, I think, very directly linked to democratization, uh, democratization uh, of society. Now, in that way, I think there's a lot to be uh, gained. Uh, and the problem we have in Hungary and I think in other countries uh, too is that the public debate about history is on a very, uh, well, let's say very low level. Uh, it's, it's basically, a, it's a heavily politicized and the argumentation uh, is usually uh, not nuanced at all in the end. So, so history is really seen as a political tool. Right, and, and, and the more it's like that, you know, this is of course then linked to history as an identity building tool. 
Mm -hmm. That's what politicians, I think, are interested in, uh, typically, without you know, meaning to bash politicians too much. But that's, that's, of course, I think, their vision. And that's very much, I think, Fidesz's vision. History is a tool in creating national pride, right? Hungarian history is interesting because we, we have a we Like have the a great statue is, 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 is communicating It's something to be, that we can be proud of. And that's because national holidays, uh, in religion holidays, the religion, it is about religion. National holidays is always about politics, contemporary politics, use for the goal of contemporary politics. It's not in Hungary, everywhere. And, and what, is your, what, what does your research tell you if you go into the minds of the Hungarian people? Um, are people indeed looking for a more uh, broadened debate about this, or is the majority simply not interested in on the line of the politicians? Yeah, simply not interested. Historical debates, are actually uh, the task of the historians. In uh, our region, it was not like that after the collapse of the communism because the newly emerging uh, political parties or groups did not have their own identity. So the social democratic tradition died out, the uh, communist tradition disappeared, uh, the liberal tradition was not present. So there were tiny intellectual groups who created the new political parties. Uh, and they were fighting uh, uh, for new identities. But uh, the easiest way to uh, forge a new identity was to offer a vision or, a, or an interpretation of the historical past. Uh, for the conservatives, uh, 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 the important issue was that Hungarian conservatism hasn't uh, hadn't, uh, uh, was not supposed to do anything with Nazis, which the Horthy regime uh, as history or the, the, the debate on the period, well, what, or whether the Horthy regime was from the beginning on a fascist type of regime or not, etc., etc. For the main issue for the conservative politicians in this uh, debate of the historian was uh, try to find a distance from fascism. Uh, the main issue for the left was to try to find a distance from communism. Um, and, uh, but uh, whatever they said, this was a very uh, fruitful field for forging new uh, political identities. So therefore, history came into the center of uh, uh, the debates and not in social policy or f uh, international policy or real policy issues. So this is why uh, history is so overweighted. Uh, in uh, uh, these debates. On the other side, the surveys show that the uh, huge majority of the Hungarian population is not really following this debate uh, and is not really interested in, in these debates. So I uh, put a question on a questionnaire, it was a nationwide representative sample of the Hungarian population about the knowledge of the debate on this very statue. Well, 3% of the population uh, uh, has heard anything about this. Uh, though intellectual debates or TVs or whatever full with them. So uh, the other side is that something what Ferenc started to speak about, that uh, the political uh, uh, regime, the contemporary political regime, is very consciously uh, uh, try, is very, uh, is trying to create a sort of perceived threat, a fear in the population. So the migrant crisis was a good, uh, uh, is a good example for it. Migrants, uh, these are uh, the huge uh, groups from the, uh, uh, the Middle East or from Africa, whatever, who, who, who arrived to Hungary in the summer of 2015 and they created a huge crisis. They didn't want to stay in Hungary, so this, uh, uh, they wanted, all they wanted to go to Germany, to Austria, to Sweden or to the Netherlands. Uh, so uh, if you look at the reality, uh, migration is not a threat for Hungary, but the fear from the unknown, the freedom from the st for, uh, of, uh, of the stranger, of the unknown, 
is a very basic uh, uh, emotion, a very basic sentiment. And if politicians can present uh, and can generate this fear by presenting uh, it as something threatening for the nation, uh, so for your tradition, and even if they, uh, uh, if they manage uh, to uh, uh, personalize the fear to put the George Soros uh, picture on a, a, a billboard saying that this guy wants to import uh, migrants to our country, then this is a very, could be a very effective political tool for mobilization. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, getting back to anti-Semitism, this is not necessarily anti-Semitism. General anti-Semitism can be a part of general xenophobia, but it's something wider. Ferenc, that, that's, that's, I think, the reason we, we should go into that a little bit deeper. It's so easily said, especially in, uh, also in the Netherlands uh, press, Hungary is on its way back. It's going towards the 1920s, 30s. Um, do you think that's, that, that's something you, you, you can make the comparison at all? Do you see indeed the same sort of developments? And you already mentioned uh, the World Wide Web as an as a important uh, factor. Can you, can you describe that a little bit better? Yeah, right. Uh, I'll start with a smaller question, which is related to the World Wide Web. Of course, the Internet is a very small topic, as you all know. Uh, uh, I mention that specifically because I find it extremely relevant when discussing anti-Semitism and, and certain types of prejudice, right? Especially what I think also uh, Andras Kovács uh, discusses in his research, the reduction of latency, right? There were latent anti-Semites in Hungarian society, but they thought that this was an unacceptable uh, way of, of, you know, unacceptable attitude and unacceptable uh, prejudice. And the World Wide Web helped uh, uh, them uh, to realize, you know, how many uh, they were, and they, they, in a way, got to, got to be emboldened by that. That was my main point related to that. And I think the internet is really, in a way, at a moment when we realize how incredibly politically sensitive and important it is. Right? I think it's. Unfortunately, we needed the whole debate about Russian influence and Putin and so on to realize, you know, that, that the Internet is being, of course, extremely heavily politicized. And it's not only because of Russia, obviously, even though it's, it's a significant component. And, and I think also the whole debate about policymaking related to security versus, versus liberty of information, I think this will be one of the biggest debates in, in the coming years, and it's already happening, which I'm very glad to see. But, but coming back to your more general question about whether we can compare to the interval period, because that's, after all, the historical question. I'm here to talk not about the future, but about the past, rather. I think that there is, of course, a way to compare uh, the two, but one shouldn't uh, stretch this uh, analogy too far. Now, if you look at the rise and decline of liberalism uh, after the fall of communism, I think you can, you can look at periods when this happened before, right? This kind of, one might say, a pendulum uh, a swing, right? In certain moments, societies become very open, and they ch cherish uh, freedom, and then they become obsessed with security, also with stability, you know, with tradition and so on. And I think this is what we're, ha what we're seeing uh, in, in post-communist Hungary uh, in particular, right? There's a, there's a liberal opening. The country is really quite open. Uh, one shouldn't forget that Hungary was one of the most, I would say, most liberal uh, countries in, in Eastern Europe, not because the liberals were a dominant political power, but because there was a spirit of liberalism uh, in the society more widely. Uh, and the country was quite transnationalized. Also, the economy was uh, quite heavily transnationalized, and in many ways it's still is, uh, and I think that the right analogy for that, what's happening, is actually not, uh, uh, not interwar Hungary, because there you have the Horthy regime uh, being established already in 1920, right, when he's appointed Reagan and so on, but let's say Germany. Germany, I think, and I'm not saying that the regime has anything to do with Nazism, but the Weimar period is, I think, a very good example, right, a famous book by Peter Gay, a famous uh, historian who talks about the outsider as insider, right, as the, as the kind of quintessential point about Weimar culture. We had something like that in Hungary too, right? alternative culture became mainstream uh, and in a way more so than, than, than in many other uh, European countries and now there's a very strong uh, backlash against that to you know, re-establish something like a conservative national tradition uh, and, and things, of that, things of that sort. Uh, so in that sense, I think that, that that comparison is valid, and that is of course not to say that you know uh, or, or Orbán has anything to do with, with, with Nazism. That's of course way beyond what I what I would want to suggest with that, and that's something completely uh, different. But I think that 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 story is still is still relevant to to observe. Agnes, you mentioned before to me that you that in regard to this question, you say no, it's a completely different situation. First of all, it was a class society, and now we live in a mass society, and that for you makes a very big difference. You asked a question whether we can compare. 
at the beginning of the 20th century with the present situation. I said, no, you cannot compare it for, because of several reasons. I mentioned only one reason. It was a class society. There was basically, a politics went on the ground of class interest. Different interests had the working class, different interests had the bourgeoisie, German, Jew, and other kind of bourgeoisie, the gentry, and the aristocracy. They voted, if they could vote, the 20% of the people could vote at that time, women not, but they voted according to their class interest. Even in the Horty regime, basically class interest was overwhelming. Now, the classes were destroyed in communism, in Hungary, not just in Hungary, in that kind. There, were no, there is no class society anymore. And then after the communists, it's a new situation. It is a mass society. In a mass society, you, there are no class interests. You think, why, why do you think that people, you can, a poor is not a class, rich is not a class. That's, they are not classes, no class interests. What wins the people? Ideology wins the people. Ideology. You have to put all your power in manipulation. Because if you manipulate well, then you can get more votes than when you manipulate badly. And by the way, the liberals after the, uh, uh, after the system were manipulated very badly. Not because they did not manipulate, but they manipulated very badly. Orban manipulates far better than them. This is the difference. But you don't think, you cannot really think that this is really in the interest of anyone of the country. It is basically how you can get more and more votes. That's what is called populism. But it's wrong conception, because populism is, does not serve the people. That populism can mobilize the majority, but serves only the minority. Yeah? Those who have the power, most power and most property, obviously, the oligarchy. So uh, this is the new situation. That's why you cannot compare it. You cannot compare it. Different kind of means that get you the votes. Yeah. Ferenc, um, we have been talking about history so far, and I think that's important because then it gives us more insight about the current situation. But if we look a little bit ahead into the future, is it possible that a new sort of avant-garde can give Hungary a new sort of energy, a new sort of direction? Or is it indeed, um, as you point out, it's only about yeah, opportunistic staying in power and, and follow what the mass wants? Is there any sort of um, new development possible, a more positive narrative, so to say? Right. To, to be honest, if I look at the cultural output of the country, I'm, I'm quite pleased. I think Hungarian culture is, is, is in many ways flourishing. Uh, in many ways, despite the political and social realities, and in, partly because of, of the need to reflect on them, right? So, so uh, if, I, if I think about you know novelists or, or also uh, movies, of course, famously the Son of Soul and and, and others, uh, other relatively young uh, artists have have won major prizes uh, in recent years, uh, and so, so, so I, I don't fear uh, uh, for 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 Hungarian culture at all. I think Hungarian culture is very exciting and has has really a, a lot uh, to offer also. Uh, in, in, in a broader international context, partly due to the fact that the, the, let's say the biographies of most of these artists are very international, right? I mean, in a sense, we are talking about Hungarian culture, but this is a label mm -hmm. uh, which is, well, to some extent accurate, to some extent not so precise, because uh, many of these people have, have, have been in, in different uh, places. So, so, so I don't uh, have, have that fear. But then whether this is something that can politically be of major importance, I'm not so sure, right? I think we also have to realize that Hungary is not a particular cultured society in the sense that culture is important, but I think as just Andras Kovács mentioned related to the debates about history, it's still a tiny minority uh, that, that really cares about it. So, so if you want to you know, uh, make a party of 5%, make, uh, you know, make it come, come into parliament, uh, certain cultural references might be, might be important there. But if you want to win an election, a high culture, for example, just doesn't matter at all in the end, right? So. I don't agree with you fully, mm -hmm. because it depends what you call high culture. Poetry mm -hmm. was always important in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And basically, in all peasant homes, there was a petrofi at mm -hmm. least, mm -hmm. and then all right. They read the poem. If they could not read, they listened to them. So I think that was a kind of culture. Mm -hmm. And not, 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 not the sophisticated, I would say, um, 
modernists were basically accepted, but there was a kind of Hungarian culture, especially poetry, but also novels, also Yokai, also Mixat, mm -hmm. also Moritz. They were basically very, very broadly read. Mm -hmm. And there was always Hungarian culture. No politics can destroy it. At least until now, no, they hadn't destroyed it because we had good culture. We had great novelists at the present moment. We have great composers. Mm -hmm. Even the Hungarian elite does not appreciate them according to their merit, and they have great painters and uh, everything. So they, we had it also in the Horthy times, we had it also in Kadar's times. Somehow, nothing can destroy this. Norbert Ferrin says that's all true, and you also yeah, uh, memorize it, but the impact on the political culture is not there. And that's, of course, the question how can you make the connection much? <laughs> Well, I'm a bit skeptical about the concept of national culture nowadays. So if you look at uh, cultural consumption, uh, then you see that cultural consumption en masse uh, means uh, uh, consumption of Western mass, mass culture. So uh, TV series, which can be uh, uh, seen on uh, Netflix or uh, HBO or uh, uh, comics uh, uh, or uh, video or on the uh, internet, etc., etc. So, and this is therefore interesting because I think that uh, the orientation of the younger political elite, the cultural orientation of the younger political elite is mainly influenced by this Western mass culture and not by the Hungarian high culture. A Hungarian high uh, culture, uh, which I agree with uh, Ferenc, is in a way flourishing, uh, publishers, uh, cinemas, theater, Budapest, music, Ivan Fischer, you might know uh, from his, so this is uh, uh, great and very high level, but this is not an orientation point anymore for the uh, newer political elite. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, whatever occurs on the field of this uh, won't really have a strong influence, uh, neither on the orientation of the general public nor uh, uh, for uh, the political elite. So that means that the younger generation is very much into international uh, yeah. developments, but can you be, in a way, positive about that? That's an international view, in a way. That's not only focusing... It's an international mass culture. Mm -hmm. That's okay. uh, different. But that was issue. always the case, because there was not, uh, even in all society, that's why Kurzweil was the novel. What have you listened? Uh, what have people uh, singing? They were a so-called terrible Tsigang dialogue. Yeah? They were not English gypsy. So they were the operetta. They were basically not what we call high culture, which people mostly enjoy. But still, it went down after the degree. And uh, there was a relatively, relatively broader uh, uh, stratum, at least in schools. Yeah? That's yeah. Okay, well, let's broaden up uh, the talk with uh, the audience and maybe questions you might have based upon uh, the talk we had so far. First of all, uh, I uh, walk up and maybe you can shortly introduce yourself and ask the question. Hi. I keep the mic. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Adela. Thank you. I work at the um, University of Amsterdam. And um, just to the last question, I wanted to say that I don't think the question is how artistic avant-garde influence mass or pop popular publics or political culture. However, there is in Hungary currently a lot of artists working who have made a lot of artwork about, for example, the statue that was talked about, who have made a lot of public protests, who have formed Translated. very strong Translated. At, at, around this. So I think that that makes an impact, at least in Budapest. But my real question is, it seems very hard for me uh, um, to talk about anti-Semitism without talking about the violence against Roma people that has been going on and increasing during the same time of the right of, of Fidesz. So maybe it's nice to compare between the um, Jews who have assimilated and the story about Hungary and being very Hungarian 
and Roma who have never really been allowed that opportunity and never gained that. So how do we compare between the two? Andres, can you try to answer that question? Yes, that's a very important question, and there is a huge debate about that uh, in the country. So uh, the Roma population makes about 5-7% of the total Hungarian population, so it's a huge group co compared to the Jews. And uh, this is a social group uh, which lives in extreme poverty. And therefore, uh, the debate of the, so the sociologist on the issue uh, is there are two basic camps on it. The one camp argues that this is not an ethnic issue, this is a poverty issue. And uh, the cultural traits, which are considered to be Roma, traits or uh, modes of uh, living, ways of living, etc., etc., ha they have nothing to do with the Roma origin of the subject, but it has uh, uh, more uh, to do with uh, the social uh, status of uh, the subject, the extreme poverty. So it's an underclass. The other uh, camp argues that uh, uh, there are uh, uh, cultural Roma cultural traits, and they should be uh, uh, in the uh, should be the center of a new Roma identity. And this uh, new Roma identity must be developed by social movements, political uh, uh, groups, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and as such, to be integrated into Hungarianness, whatever. Uh, it is. So this is a very serious debate which runs across the lines among Roma intellectuals and in Roma and not uh, uh, Roma intellectuals. But that's obvious that uh, uh, the underclass status has something to do with anti-Roma prejudice. Uh, it is an addition to the uh, uh, social uh, uh, disadvantages what uh, uh, these people uh, have to uh, uh, live with. And this uh, is an issue which creates a permanent conflict, a conflict which is exploited by the Hungarian extreme right party, which is the Jobbik uh, uh, party. The Jobbik party was the first party which raised this issue into politics and uh, created a sort of issue ownership which is important for a party. So this was the party which uh, 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 said, OK, we won't hide any more uh, that uh, there, is, there are serious conflicts between Roma and Hungarian, and we have the solution for it. And these solutions are quite radical uh, and racist uh, in political uh, sense. And uh, so uh, the Roma issue, therefore, is not directly connected to the Jewish issue, because socially it's a totally different uh, niche in the society, but if you raise the interpretation of the issue on the level of uh, 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 racism or prejudice or po the political handling of racism and prejudice, then they have something uh, to do uh, in common. But is it also debated in regards of the Second World War? That, that was also, I think, part of your question. But please, uh, is it also debated in regards of the Second World War, the position of the Roma? That was also part of her question. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the position of the Roma on what? The position of the Roma, is it also being debated in regards of the Second World War? And the fact that they have been, uh, they have been attacked and uh, transported as well. Right. Well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll try to answer with an anecdote. Yeah, yeah. When they created the Holocaust Memorial uh, Center yeah, in Budapest, uh, and it opened its sorry, it opened its permanent exhibition back in 2006, one of the most contested questions was how to relate to the violence against Roma. And the way that they they uh, decided to deal with the issue at the time was to include five family stories, four of which were Jewish and one of which was a Roma family, and then they divided it uh, in the in the uh, uh, on, on on the wall. Uh, which was heavily criticized, I think, later on, uh, that they in many ways, well, uh, you know, drew a line and said, okay, now here comes the, the separate uh, story. So they haven't really uh, integrated it in, in any meaningful way, and, but at least uh, there was the sense that, there, that it should be there. Okay. Yes, and then there is this, and this is another debate, well, uh, the debate on the Roma, Roma Holocaust, because uh, 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 
differently from Germany, uh, Roma were not persecuted in Hungary in a systematic uh, way. There was persecution against them in certain uh, uh, regions of the country, some uh, uh, several 20,000 Roma were deported to Auschwitz, uh, uh, etc. But there were no, no racial laws mentioning Roma under the uh, Horthy period. So, uh, therefore, historians argue that these are different stories, which doesn't mean that the Roma story should be neglected, okay. yeah. but they should be treated differently. Okay. Other questions, please. Okay, then I go to that way. I start with you, then I walk to you. Please introduce yourself and your question. Hi, Ilse Lazanos. I am a historian, amongst other things, of Hungarian Jewry. Um, very happy to see you all again. And um, my question has to do with the different levels of anti-Semitism. So, Agnes Heller, you mentioned that um, at the level of the Orban regime, it may actually be an opportunistic anti-Semitism that's aimed at um, gaining more power, keeping more power, therefore making it sound like it's less of a threat. However, these ideas do seminate, and these campaigns, the poster campaigns, uh, actually are so widespread um, that it influences people, let's say, on the ground. So these two levels of anti-Semitism how do they relate? And also, in the last year, like maybe five or ten years, about half a million people have left the country, which is way more than after 56. Young people. Um, has it become a political act to stay in Hungary? And you address this to Agnes or to? Okay. Who wants to respond? the two sort of anti-Semitism which are mentioned and the fact that so many young people leave the country and if is staying a sort of political act nowadays. Well, then I try to say, say something about the billboard campaign and anti-Semitism. So as I said before, uh, this campaign aimed at uh, mobilizing uh, the feeling of threat, external threat, and it was embodied by uh, personalized by George Soros, who was presented for the Hungarian public as a American multimillionaire with international uh, influence, uh, 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 pulling the threats uh, from above, etc., uh, etc. Et so, I will I make you an example. If you tell you the window is open, then it means that the window is open. But uh, if, you, if I, your husband or your partner tells it to you, uh, driving the car and 20, uh, 120 kilometers away from your hood, the window is open, then you start to be frightened because then it means that you left the window open at home. So the meaning of the sentence and the message is always contextual. What is the context of that message on Soros or on the threat? The context is that if someone knows already that uh, the Jews are clannish, inter conspiring internationally, trying to pull the threats from behind, etc. So if someone knows all the stereotypes about the Jews, then it will translate the message into an anti-Semitic uh, uh, statement. If someone does not know these stereotypes, then the message will remain on another uh, uh, level. So the surveys I have made on anti-Semitism showed that about one third of the Hungarian population knows these stereotypes uh, and supports these stereotypes. Perhaps um, another part knows them as well but doesn't support them. So at least for one third of the population, this message, message means uh, what the context suggests, but for another I don't know, 40% of the population but, but Andras, are radically against uh, the migrants, yeah. it won't have an anti-Semitic meaning. But what do you think then of a government now, which me, is communicating uh, let me this? Let ask a direct question. I left Hungary because of political reason. When I returned to Hungary, I returned because these political reasons 
because of which I left Hungary, were disappeared, disappeared with the system change. There was no communist Hungary anymore and no reason not to return. But I remain now in Hungary also for political reasons. Situation changes. Um, about the anti-Semitism, no one told till this moment there is no leftist anti-Semitism in Hungary. That is this aspect of anti-Semitism, which is typical in many places in, in Western Europe, maybe also here. There is no, and especially in Scandinavia and England, uh, there is no leftist anti-Semitism in Hungary. Traditionally, Hungarian anti-Semitism was right-wing, and this tradition ca is kept intact. Of course, there are certain anti-Semite persons with anti-Semite feelings on the left, but there is no... But Agnes, can you also no. respond to the question of the fact that so many young people now are leaving the country? And what does that tell you? There are many young people leave the country for two different reasons. Uh, one reason that uh, they are better paid outside. A second reason, because they do not get in the country the means which is important to develop their own talents. For a doctor, there are no other means as the means which are so important in modern medicine are certainly not available in Hungarian hospitals. So they cannot, they want to develop these capacities and they have no op option to develop. Third, because they don't feel themselves at home, because they feel themselves more free abroad than in Hungary, and they stick to this kind of personal freedom when no one cares what they do at home, whether they are Christians or atheists or whatever, whether they are homosexuals or heterosexuals, no one cares for this. They want to live in this kind of area, not because of political correctness, but because of liberalism. Okay, I give away the microphone, but I get it back as long as it starts with 1879 and so on. Uh, I have a question about memory politics. You started about it. And I'm curious, uh, because I think it's a bigger debate, not only in Hungary, but in Europe, about the United States identity politics, memory politics. And I want to know, and it's a question for the three, how you relate that to uh, maybe anti-intellectualism? Because you came to Germany and you supported the, the view of history, and you know, it, it broadened the debate, but how can it also narrow the debate? Or, you know, so that's a question I have about how you see, not only in Hungary, but in Europe, the relation between anti-intellectualism and uh, uh, memory politics. I think that memory politics became important also because we live in a mass society. In class societies, different classes had their different memories of the past. That is, aristocracy had a different memory than the workers and the bourgeoisie. They had a different memory of events, of wars, of conflicts, totally opposite memories. In a contemporary society, which is not only in Hungary, but basically everywhere, mass society, ideology it has such an important power that people can be manipulated, that the majority, irrespective of their position, yet participates, but should participate in the same kind of memory politics. That is, the past is in a way presented in one single color for everyone. Everyone should believe in this single color because they have no reason not to believe in the single color. That's novelty. I must admit that, you know, I, I'm quite old fashioned in this respect that I think that the concept of history is actually more useful than the concept of memory. Uh, I know this is really something that goes against, I think, much of what is being discussed uh, today. But I also think that in Germany, if you think about it, the point is not that Germans remember the Second World War in any you know, uh, way that we would, we would like them to. Obviously, it's not that. It's that they have a culture of discussing it analytically. They have a culture of discussing it in a way more objectively, if you wish, or, or more neutrally from multiple perspectives. 
perspectives, and that helps a lot. But that has little to do with memory, right? Memory is, is, it shouldn't be valorized in a way that it often, it often is. Memory should so be something that we reflect on. And that is, I think, the point of also of history uh, writing in a way to help people do that. And of course, we live in an age where, where there's a lot of attempts to reshape memory. And this is, of course, something very dangerous, uh, if you wish. I mean, this is something very authoritarian. It usually comes from above, right? It usually comes from an agenda of let's, you know, uh, change the way people think about their lives, right? You remember it in a certain way, but you should not remember it in a different way. Well, that's, that's not something I'm, I'm, I'm at all uh, in, in favor of, of course. But you see, this is kind of manipulation of historical memory. It's not manipulation of our memorizing, remembering this or that. Historical memory is in writing. It is book. It is in history books in the, for the high schools or the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. And this is what historical memory is all about, what you feed the kids. And the kids we are fed by this historical memory will believe that this is what has happened, and these are the guilty ones, and these are the innocent ones. Okay. And particularly in Hungary, it would be important because Hungary had two, went through two terrible traumas. Yeah. The Trianon trauma, no one said any word. We go to the last uh, question, Agnes. Trianon trauma is the one trauma, and the Holocaust trauma is the second trauma. These are two big traumas. Traumas should be discussed now. Yes. yes. Because otherwise they are poison. Okay. Last question. Yes. Uh, 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 three short points. It's it's. Oh, Evelyn Gans. I'm I'm of modern Jewish studies and of history of anti-Semitism. In the Netherlands, there are quite some parallels, but I can't go into this now. Memory politics are also. Make it into questions. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, uh, the two museums, uh, the House of Terror and. Uh, the Holocaust Museum, House of Terror in the center of Bu Budapest, Holocaust Museum, very, very far away, uh, hardly any people coming. House of Terror, many, many, many people coming. And an, an, an Hungarian student I met, she was, I, I, so my question is, what is the difference between the, the now very much threatened um, university on which uh, Andras works and the state university. This young student was of the state university and she was uh, 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 very, uh, so to say, reactionary. She was very much in favor of the House of Terror. Second question, is it the same? Let, let me start answering and then we come back. Otherwise we can we forget the next question. So the position of so, the two museums. Well, that's a very interesting uh, issue in Budapest because there are two museums. Uh, they speak about more or less the same historical period and they suggest two totally different narratives. Uh, uh, the house, I don't know how, whether you have heard about the House of Terror, it's a museum on, partly on Hungarian uh, fascism and uh, communism, which suggests that uh, Hungary was always on uh, a European uh, track, but it was derailed uh, by two occupations, first the German one and then the Russian one, and now after 1990, Hungary got back to the uh, European civilized uh, track. So the responsibility for everything that happened in Hungary under fascism and communism was not a Hungarian responsibility, but it was uh, 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 the responsibility of two, two occupying forces. The second museum, the Holocaust Museum, tells a totally different story. The story is there that what happened, the Holocaust, uh, there was a continuous track uh, starting with 1920, which led uh, as a final act to the Hungarian Holocaust. So the Hungarian responsibility is uh, substantial. An in interesting issue is that the both museums are there and uh, you can see two historical conflict in history, historical narratives uh, if you have enough time and uh, patience to uh, visit the uh, two museums. The first one, the House of Terror, is in a better position because uh, it became, uh, its narrative became a part of the official historical uh, narrative and therefore organized school groups are going there uh, and uh, there are programs uh, organized around it, etc. The other one is the, it's not closed down, it was even established by the Fidesz government, by the first Fidesz government, uh, uh, but it doesn't have this type of background. So this is basically uh, the main Second difference. Second question. 
Okay, second question uh, is, um, is, uh, concre uh, uh, is, is, are the, the, is the Jew and the Muslim interchangeable? Sometimes in Holland it is, for example, when the ban on ritual slaughter was discussed, but also in Poland, uh, neo-Nazis and extreme right groups, when they were protesting against Muslims coming, refugees is Muslims coming to Poland, um, they burned a, a, a Hasidic puppet of a Jew. So, um, and also in Holland, on the worldwide net, uh, there's people are, are saying of the Freedom Party sympath symp sympathizers, uh, why don't they put the Muslims in the gas ovens just as they did, as Hitler did with the Jews? And um, uh, I, I was curious if this go intermingles, and I can. Uh, easily put because of this. And Let me ask Ferenc if, if he sees the same sort of mm -hmm. intertwined and connectivity. Ferenc. Uh, right, I think it's a very contemporary topic in Hungary. I brought it up uh, in my speech uh, towards the end because I think it's very exciting to look at it, but it's something that only has, ha has been happening for a very few years now. Uh, so I think it's sort of a research horizon. We don't really have a tradition of discussing this topic uh, in Hungary, I would say, even though, as you know, Hungary has, a, a, if, if you look at the longer term history, a connection to, uh, to the Muslim world, a connection, of course, uh, through the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman conquest, and so on. But, but the fact that, that, that there is a sort of anti semitic in the late 19th century uh, was meant to also refer to Arabs, uh, the, right, in, in, in the way that the, the, the concept was, was, was framed, uh, is not something that is widely known. And I wouldn't say that, that within Hungary uh, the, the relation to Muslims and, and Jews is interchangeable. I think that would be going way too far. I think the relation to Jews is something very, very specific. And here I would like to make just one more short remark. What's very interesting about anti-Semitism in Hungary is that Jews are not as such disliked or disrespected in society. Jews are typically quite well regarded, uh, but the very often many positive uh, uh stereotypes or positive uh, ideas that are attached to, to Jewishness are combined with certain negatively loaded or very morally uh, you know, negatively loaded terms, you know, such as you know, somebody smart and, and, and ambitious and cunning, right, or, or diligent, but you know, also uh, these kinds of things, right? And that can turn it into a very uh, strange mix, uh, meaning that an inferiority complex is, is somehow combined with a superiority complex. Right? And that is so, somehow very explosive. This is, I think, what's specific about anti-Semitism. Now, I don't think that can be compared to e either uh, the uh, discussion about Muslims or the anti-Roma uh, uh, racism, which is, of course, much more widespread uh, and, and much more you know, crude uh, in many ways. Right? I mean, again, one shouldn't, uh, I think, forget, and again, Andras Kovac, I think, shows this very nicely as well, that Jews are actually among the more liked uh, groups in society, if you look at overall. Right? I mean, Arabs or Roma are much, much more negatively viewed uh, by people in Hungary, but there is some Something explosive about anti-Jewish prejudice, nevertheless, right? Okay. So. I want to go back to the one question. closing remark for Agnes. Yeah. yeah. Sir. Okay, well, sorry, sorry. And I went to the terror, the museum, terror museum, and Holocaust museum uh, to this question. I don't think it's a problem that two narratives. Because Great. obviously there is a Holocaust narrative and there should be a gulag narrative. Because the Gulag, millions of people were murdered, among them many hundred thousand Hungarians as well. They also should have, should have a museum and they should have their memory respected and not forgotten. The problem is not to have two museums. The problem is about the narratives of the museums. But you said that basically the uh, terror museum tells a story uh, about hung a Hungarian narrative. Although it is a Soviet narrative, it is a Soviet, it's not just a Hungarian narrative. It's a, so it's a communism, it's a Soviet narrative, it's not a Hungarian narrative. Hungarians could say the same thing. We were oppressed by them. Yeah, we, we, uh, so the narrative is wrong in the terror museum, not because it should respect, it should memorize the victims of Bolshevism. That's a very important thing, the millions of victims. Okay. But it should not falsify history. Joel, That's my problem. Let, let me try to, to conclude Museum this morning. night. Thank you so much. Let me try to conclude this night. And I'm going to say, I'm a moderator, so I'm going to say maybe things you, you don't agree with. But we were memorizing Peter Gay book about the Weimar Republic. And this book is basically about loyalty. 
and the loyalty of the elite and the loyalty of the middle class too long towards the development of the Nazi party's uh, position. And I have whole night if the, the feeling that there is too much loyalty. It was maybe also the story from the painters from the early 1910s. Too much loyalty instead of maybe organize more criticism, more reflection on what is happening in the society. Or is this a little bit overdone? No, I don't think that's overdone. That's a very legitimate question. I think the main answer I have, the times are different. And I know through the negotiations in Budapest, several people who have their loyalty, but they have their uh, apartment in Tel Aviv. They have their legs also outside. And it's much easier to get out uh, and I think still they have that loyalty. You can also, I experienced that loyalty in Tel Aviv, uh, where I worked as a curator with a big project on Hungary, and it was unbelievable. Also the fights on the table between the neologues and the orthodox and all of them, but it was all Hungary. And as uh, you mentioned, the kibbutz of my uh, partner in life, it's not only Hungary, but part of the kibbutz is Hungary, but firmly Zionistic. That's the answer I have. Well, I think that's a good and interesting answer. Thank you so much. Last remark? I think the discussion on the museums, I forgot to mention that, it proves that we were on the right track to show these paintings, to show these painters, and through them try to tell the story. We didn't develop a narrative. And therefore, more narratives next to each other, which all together tells the story of Hungary. I'd like to thank you so much, the three uh, speakers of tonight. Give them a very big hand. Thank you so much. And Joel, thank you so much for your introduction for tonight's uh, exposition. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, as said, the exhibition is on till the 25th of September. Um, you are now invited to have a talk at the bar, if you like, or to ask some questions directly to uh, our bar. Thank you so much.